all here tonight. My name is David Skidmore. I'm a professor in, in, of political science and also director of the Principal Financial Group Center for Global <laughs> Citizenship, which is uh, sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, as, as most of you know, we the center sponsors events like this throughout the academic year, and this happens to be the last event of the uh, 2014-2015 academic year, and we're going out with with a with a bang because we have a very special guest with us uh, tonight. Um, I also wanted to to uh, thank again the principal financial group for the support that is offered to the center, to our international programs at Drake, and uh, to acknowledge that I believe we have some principal folks joining us tonight. If you're with principal, raise your hand. Uh, wonderful. We're, we're very happy you're joining us tonight. So, um, I also want to, before I introduce our speaker, to uh, thank my, my good friend, uh, uh, Dung Long, who is uh, was crucial in helping to uh, with some of the arrangements for tonight's event and who's been a good friend of Drake and of the Center for Global Citizenship. Thank you. Um, so tonight's uh, 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 guest speaker is a, a very prominent expert on China. Uh, professor Wu Guangwu is a professor of political science uh, uh, in China and international, uh, excuse me, Asia-Pacific relations at the University of Victoria in Canada. He received his BA from Peking University, his master's from the Graduate School of the Chinese Academy of so Social Sciences, and an MA and PhD from Princeton University. He once had a career in China in journalism and politics as an editorialist for the People's Daily in Beijing, policy and advisor and speechwriter to the national leadership of China. Uh, however, in the wake of the uh, crackdown on the pro-democracy movement in 1989 in Tiananmen Square, uh, Professor Wu re resigned his position in protest, left China, and made his career in the United States and, and, and Canada as a uh, a, a scholar studying Chinese politics and its, its role in the world. He's held appointments as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, a Luce Fellow at Columbia, a uh, postdoctoral position at Harvard, and uh, uh, a visiting professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. His research interests cover institutional change, political economy, globalization, elite politics, media politics, foreign policy and regional security. Um, he is the author, co-author, and editor of 25 books in English and Chinese and, and many uh, uh, articles and, and book chapters. So uh, we're very happy that he's here to speak to us tonight on the topic of China's rise and its global implications in human security. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wu. This part of the United States. My experience in the United States, uh, basically, it was uh, both uh, coast areas, east coast and west coast. Uh, so it's really a uh, uh, great pleasure to visit uh, such a you know, uh, big burn of the United States. Uh, today, my topic is China's rise and global implication in human security. That's a huge topic uh, because we are talking about huge phenomena. Yeah, China is rising to be superpower, almost parallel to the United States in terms of economic power, uh, if not yet in military power, if not yet in soft power. Uh, so, you know, estimation said uh, the Chinese economic power has already surpassed the United States. But anyway, yeah, the trend is still continuing. So, uh, people talk a lot already about implications, aftermath of the rise of China, uh, particularly in this country, 
because as the the existing leadership country of the world. So uh, people worry about what kind of a challenge China as rising power to bridge to the United States as difficult power uh, to to the United States and its liberal democratic system, the values, the culture, the way of life. Uh, so my focus will be one dimension of these so many different multifaceted you know, implications of the rights of China, not particularly to the United States, not particularly to any given country, but to you know, so-called human beings as individuals. So I uh, try to provide a conceptual framework to understand those aftermaths with the rise of China in terms of non-geopolitical, you know, state-to-state -state relations, and uh, try to give overview of those issues in this regard. I use the term in my security to cover those issues. So basically, uh, I will talk about the concept of human security uh, at first. So what is human security? And then, what kind of challenges in this regard? The rise of China brings to global you know, uh, societies, to actually every individual of human societies. And so also, how to understand the so-called China model and the inability uh, of Chinese government to deal with human insecurity. So the Chinese government is really powerful, is capable in promoting, for example, economic development, in also dealing with foreign relations. But why the Chinese government is so powerful, Chinese government is not so good at, for example, you know, providing food safety, I mean, uh, safe food to its own citizens and also uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, then I'll give you, uh, I'll give a very uh, uh, brief conclusion. The concept of human security yeah, basically uh, began to appear in mid 1990s. Yeah, that means, you know, uh, in the years after the Cold War. There are already many uh, definitions or concepts of human security. Uh, a very influential one is provided by UNDP in 1994 uh, uh, in its Human Development Report, 1994. Basically, this concept emphasizes the non-military nature of human security. Uh, uh, the paragraph is pretty passionate. It's a pretty, I uh, mean, uh, poetic, actually. Uh, it defines human security in this way. Human security is a child who did, who did not die, a disease that did not spread, a job that was not cut, uh, ethnic tension that did not explode in violence, as we saw uh, yesterday in Baden, right? A dissident who was not silenced every day we could see that in China. Human security is not concerned with weapons. It is concerned with human life and dignity. And the next year, in 1995, a commission on global governance also provides its own uh, definition of human security. It emphasizes non-state nature of human security. Uh, particularly, uh, it uh, draws distinction between the security of states and the security uh, of peoples. Also, I would like to give you the third definition of human security. Yeah. It doesn't work. <laughs> That's okay. Commission on Human Security in 2003. Yeah. Emphasize the protection of the vital core of all human beings in ways that enhance human freedom and human fulfillment. Uh, the quotation says, human security means protecting fundamental freedoms, freedoms that are the essence of life. It means protecting people 
from a critical severe and pervasive widespread threat and situations. It means using processes that build on people's chances and aspirations. It means creating political, social, environmental, economic, military, and cultural systems that together gave people the building blocks of survival, livelihood, and dignity. Basically, from those concepts, you can say there is very clear line of conceptual evolution of security, focusing on human dimensions of security. But I have my critics of the, those human security concepts. For those students uh, in international politics, you are familiar with these concepts of state military security. When we talk about international security, people ask why we have a war, why the peace cannot be maintained. So basically, when we have the security, the concept of security in international politics, we are talking about uh, you know uh, interstate interstate conflicts, basically in the term I uh, mean in the form of military conflict. So in the initial stage of international studies, the concept of security is basically about state military security. So uh, that's very, that was very influential. Then gradually, yeah, the non-military dimensions were incorporated into the concept, uh, particularly in recent years, uh, concept so-called comprehensive security is invented. Uh, people began to talk about you know, state security, uh, not only in military terms, but also in, for example, mil uh, uh, economic terms. Actually, a lot of experts, they emphasize that you know, um, uh, a state military strength is based on that country's economic power. So when we talk about state military security, you have to pay attention to non-military dimensions, particularly economic dimensions. And particularly in the post-Cold War era, people began to realize that there was something even comprehensive security was not able to cover. So people began to use this term called non-traditional security to cover those issues. Like those issues, you know, I mentioned, I mean those uh, 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 quoted concepts I mentioned. In my interpretation, yeah, non-traditional non security is not really good concept. Yeah, traditional security means okay, military security, and uh, military security of states, of country, of you know, uh, political system, economic system. And uh, non-traditional security is much much wider, including, for example, environmental security. Yeah, including soft power including, you know, uh, pandemic disease, uh, including a lot of, uh, you know, issues in this regard. But why non-traditional security is not a good definition, not a good concept? Because we know that from common sense of scientific research, you have to define something with its own term. You cannot use some other thing to define something. So when you say, what is human being? Human being is non-animals. That's not a good concept of human being, right? So non-traditional security is good in terms of highlighting the issues, you know, as security issues with non-traditional nature. But it doesn't actually uh, disclose the nature of those issues, why those issues should be grouped into this concept of non-traditional security. If they are non-traditional, why they are non-traditional? What do you mean by tradition? So that's why uh, some other scholars suggest this concept as human security. Why I particularly emphasize this distinction between non-traditional security and human security? Because in this country, particularly, yeah, people and even scholars they don't like to use the concept of human security. In other uh, Indian democratic countries, including Western European countries, including Japan and my country, Canada. Actually, people like to use this concept of human security, referring to those issues covered by non-traditional security in this country. 
why the United States doesn't like to use the concept of human security, later I will discuss that. So that's why, you know, so you can equal, uh, you know, you can say, you can regard the two concepts as equal to each other, but the non-traditional security is a murky concept of a human security. But human security, yeah, as defined by those uh, quoted paragraphs, I think are really broad. A child didn't die. Uh, a child can die with so many different reasons. Yeah, it can die in war, so that not tra that's traditional security. It can die because of you know uh, insufficient nutrition. That's really a different reason from you know war criminal. It can die from you know earthquake. So many different reasons can call you know. Uh, demise of our fragile life as human beings. So I think human security uh, you know, concepts provided by those organizations are still too broad in my perspective, in my point of view. And also I would like to distinguish between human security and human rights. Do you still remember my third quotation about you know, freedom? Okay, all those freedom could be included into the concept of human security. So if that's the concept, so what is the big difference between human security and human rights? If human security is human rights, why we need the concept of human security? Human rights, I think, is better, right? Because it emphasizes rights. We know what we want to do. Yeah, we have ability, we have right, we have obligation to do that. So why human security? And also, if you talk about nutrition, for example, uh, for children, uh, that's also outcome of economic development and human development. So if a, a child dies because of insufficient hospital treatment, it dies you know, because of uh, underdevelopment in terms of a human development. So in that way, we can say human security as human development. So that means when you have economic development with sufficient attention to human consequences of economic development, you can achieve human security. I'm not satisfied with the, those concepts of human security. I try to provide my own uh, definition of human security. Different from human rights, different from human development, different from you know, those quotations uh, of those of uh, uh, organizations. So basically, my definition says human security is global public good for all human beings in their relationship with natural surroundings. Actually, when we talk about security, uh, usually we think about, okay, my security is under threat from some other people. So that means, okay, people to people, person to person relationship, a social relationship. When we talk about human security, we refer to human beings, you know, as one entity, as whole. Everybody, as member of this uh, biggest group, actually, you know, how this person threats another person, both as human beings. So, as human beings, the threat can come from natural surroundings. A public good could be a uh, uh, concept may be not so familiar to some of you. Uh, public good means not private good, of course. So that, but basically, we know uh, the nature of a public good means that everybody can share that, but that doesn't mean, you know, your share, uh, the more is your share, the less is my share. There's no zero sum game in terms of a uh, public good. For example, uh, if we have a bread, if your brother has that bread, you will have no opportunity to have that bread. So that bread, bread is public good. Air is public good. Yeah, particularly quality of air is public good. The clearer air you breath, that means the clearer air I breath. So we share. When the quality of air is improved, everybody share that. Everybody gets benefit from that. It doesn't mean because you breathe cleaner 
air, I have to, you know, press dirty air. There is no such thing, right? So security, yeah, national security is also public good. Uh, one person, one citizen in the United States feels safer from public security, from, you know, the threat from other countries, invasion. Who would actually invade the United States? Canada? <laughs> anyway, so basically, you know, everybody's safety, everybody's security in these terms is the same. It doesn't mean, okay, you as a Canadian, I mean, American citizen, when you feel that public security is improved, so your neighbor is suffering from deteriorating public security. So public security and national security are public good. But the more secure United States citizens feel in terms of other countries' military conflict with this country or invasion of this country, other countries' citizens may not feel the same degree of security, right? So national security is not global public good. When American citizens feel safer, more secure, you know, from, for example, than Canadian citizens, you know, feel in terms of national security. So maybe Canadian citizens could feel, we don't live in, you know, shadow of American invasion. Yeah, I would welcome that. But actually, <laughs> yeah, in theory, you know, uh, national security of Canada and the United States could be zero something, actually. Yeah, maybe 200 years ago. That was the case, actually. But human security is global public goods. It's different from national security, actually. I mean, when Chinese people leave rest dirty air, that means our quality of air could be worse than before. Active. Yeah, because this is small global. It is its global village. And when the Chinese citizens, they worry about safety of their food, we also worry about safety of food from China. Active. Right? Because later I will talk about some uh, statistics. Actually, uh, even maybe all Iowa could be different. Uh, but actually, Canada is also a big agricultural producer, but we import a lot of food from China. I think in the United States, actually, it's also a very big importer of Chinese food. And uh, pandemic disease, yeah. When Chinese people suffer from, you know, uh, uh, SARS, right, in 2003, actually, around the globe, Everybody feels less safer, less less secure than before. Right. So these kind of things. So uh, uh, to my interpretation, all other concepts of security emphasize a given human growth security in its relationship with uh, other human groups. Early concepts of human security have still been influenced by that line of reasoning. So basically, my point is that. So not this social, this human group security against that, that social uh, human group security, but uh, human beings, yeah, equal to each other. So with this concept of human security, uh, we emphasize natural threats, including, I have to emphasize, those man-made natural threats, against which human societies as a whole have to protect themselves. For example, earthquake is a natural disaster, but yeah, an earthquake can destroy so many lives in China, for example, in Sichuan, than in California. That's not because of you know, earthquake itself. It's because of social system. It's because of state regulation. It's because of technological development. It's because of a lot of different factors. Man, and also, yeah, the pa pa pandemic disease could be man man actually. It's a natural phenomenon, but when you look, later I will show you a picture, yeah, look uh, in surrounding, surrounded by garbage, for example, 
Yeah, actually in China, many places. People live in pretty good looking buildings, but when you come out from your building, everywhere, you know, garbage, trash, I feel like. So these kind of, you know, surrounding can produce disease. And that's my main idea. So basically, if uh, it involves some groups of human beings threat some others, it doesn't apply to public goods of all human beings. Uh, that's my uh, basic point. Then with this definition, we can see a lot you know, issues. A lot of issues could belong uh, to uh, human security. Uh, there's a wide range of human security issues. Uh, first of all, climate change. Yeah. Uh, everybody talks about climate change today, and yes, because it affects everybody. Yeah, you are poor, you are rich, you are Chinese, you are American. Yeah, you live in a park, but everywhere. So climate change affects your security. So that's a truly public good of global village. And wider environmental issues, actually, not only climate change. Yeah, uh, wider environmental issue and wider ecological issues, for example, I already mentioned that many times, quality of air. And also, uh, quality of water, and not only quality of water. Actually, in Iowa, you may not feel uh, the problem of the scarcity of water. In California, people feel that. In China, people actually uh, live with threat of scarcity of water. So, when you have dirty water, you have a problem. When you have no water, you have no problem because you, you already died, right? So <laughs> it's a really bigger challenge, actually, right? And also, I uh, mentioned uh, food security and food safety. This is, you know, state of big producer of food, good food. Yeah, I already enjoyed for lunch, yesterday dinner, today dinner. And uh, from British Columbia, where I live, also, yeah, we enjoy really good food. And people now talk about, you know, uh, uh, local, right? And we know that, yeah. So many people in this world, they don't have enough food. Yeah, actually, so when we talk about food security, we talk about if we have sufficient food to support our human beings, actually, uh, basically, I think uh, that's a problem of uh, social distribution. Uh, Food safety is another problem. Food safety is about, you know, not really quality of uh, food. It's basically the bottom line quality of food. Uh, we know a lot of stories in this regard, particularly in China. Yeah, so for example, yeah, milk can be polluted, uh, actually, you know, uh, during the process of production. And so children can have that really bad milk, and so their future becomes uh, really bad. And uh, this kind of problem is a big challenge to today's Chinese population and also to Chinese uh, governments. Uh, I also mentioned uh, academics. Yeah. In the global village, when there is a pandemic disease and it's very possible, it spreads over the globe very quickly in just a number of days and number of weeks. And also wider human security ramifications of other issues. The issues could be not by nature human security issues. For example, energy consumption. You use energy consumption to produce something, and energy consumption itself is energy is a product good. Uh, I can use more electricity than these other people would have opportunity, uh, less opportunity to consume electricity. But some issues produced by energy consumption, for example, air pollution, uh, of course, right? And immigration, yeah, immigration is good, of course. Otherwise, I would not be standing here, right? <laughs> so, but that also brings a lot of challenges to human security. Because when people travel, okay, other bad things, uh, for example, virus, yeah, travel with people, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, some other things. But anyway, uh, so many other issues, they also produce human security problems. So basically now we have a hope, a clear picture 
of human security, that means uh, global public goods. When we talk about human security threat, we need, when that issue emerges, everybody on this globe can be under threat to some different degrees. And why human security is, you know, with the rights of China, uh, we know uh, the rights of China really breathe about a lot of human security challenges. Uh, in the of many aspects, China's rights has presented a huge challenge to, for example, we mentioned already a lot, uh, air quality, water, uh, 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 pandemic disease, food safety, a lot of things. And also, you know, uh, within China, uh, the vulnerability of human security is really, really high. Yeah. Uh, so when everybody in the global village can suffer from the air pollution originated from China, and Chinese people suffer first, actually, right? So a very big problem. And also, uh, the rise of China presents human security challenges, not only because of, you know, these kind of, you know, uh, domestic issues. Uh, also, China, you know, uh, economic power, uh, geopolitical influence, uh, even soft power influence, so stretches to other regions. First, to its neighboring areas, like, uh, you know, uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, uh, then for other parts, across the you know, Pacific, North America, and to Africa, to uh, every part of the world. So particularly, you know, in those regions, beyond China's borders, and those kind of, you know, expansion of China's power can produce local consequences in terms of human security. For example, when China invests in, you know, Southeast Asian countries to produce, you know, electricity for supporting China's industrialization. So the Mekong River can produce human security issues uh, in South China, uh, in South uh, East Asian countries. So uh, the water resource would become a big problem because those uh, lower countries, along with the Mekong River, they depend on, you know, water resource supplied by the Mekong River to cut with their rice, you know, fields. When China build up dams, you know, over the Mekong River to produce electricity and the fishing, you know, industry and agri local agriculture could be uh, harmed, actually. So it produces uh, human security issues. Uh, yes, we already talked about global, you know, nature of human security issues. So not only uh, when China presents its influence during this region, when the human security issues uh, follow, even China, you know, no, any single Chinese travels to that place, even there is a place today, okay? So there, you know, the influence with the rise of China can produce human security ramification in that region because, you know, the global flow of, you know, all the things like, uh, you know, water, like uh, <coughs> air. So the global eco ecological system, the whole system, the entire system, it, it can be uh, affected. Uh, the picture, yeah, I think you are familiar with that. If you have an opportunity to travel to China, particularly uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, winter, yeah, it's uh, not uh, rare. You can see, I think the picture uh, was taken in Beijing. Yeah. Uh, the high rise building, uh, so very close to the position uh, the photographer took, but uh, uh, not clear, the image. So why the rise of China presents huge human security challenges? Uh, actually, uh, first of all, because of size, because China is a huge country, because the Chinese population is huge, because the Chinese economy is huge. So because Chinese consumption of energy, of natural resources to support its economic development is huge. 
So the size really matters. Yeah. If, uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, a small country, yeah, like Belize, you know, it's more nice, you know, tomorrow and uh, Russia to be, you know, uh, really industrialized country, the impact will not be so great, like China great to uh, the world, I think. So China's enormous size, and it, that, you know, really produced the implications to the scale of human security issues and to the sever severity of human insecurity. And we know, actually, China is already the largest emitter of greenhouse gases measured on annual basis, not on historical basis, because China, you know, uh, recently uh, became a big emitter of greenhouse gases. Why I emphasize annual basis? Because China, the Chinese government argued that actually 100 years ago, you know, they already began to do that. So why you blaming me today? And actually, historically accumulated, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emission from your country is much, much bigger than China. So, but actually, you are really rising power in this regard. You know, on annual basis, China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases today, surpassing the United States. Yeah, the United States is already number two, I'm sorry. <laughs> and yes, China has become the largest energy consumer in the world since two long time. Yeah, in the past 65 years, China has been always the largest energy consumer, and particularly in coal, C-O-A-L. My pronunciation is really bad. Okay, anyway, uh, so coal, coal per per consumption really, you know, makes pollution. That's why we saw a picture like that smog. So smog is like the notorious yeah, in today's China. Why in winter the situation is worse than in other seasons? Yeah, because of coal you know, consumption. So energy consumption uh, really, you know, <coughs> provides quality of life to us, but also provides uh, challenges to us. And because of a size, Actually, in terms of food, yeah, it's particularly relevant to this day. Uh, China is already fourth the largest consumer of food worldwide, of course, yeah, because the largest population. And we Chinese people, our number one hobby, maybe, yeah, is eating. Yeah, <laughs> and so uh, you have uh, delicious Chinese food. And so that's not a surprise to say that China is the largest consumer of food in the, food in the, in the whole world. But China is also the largest producer, larger than ever, you know, of food, actually, worldwide. But, you know, when food safety becomes a problem in China, because China is the largest producer of food worldwide, so that becomes a really big problem. In 2008, China became net global food importer and is now the world's largest soybean importer. That's not a big problem. Yeah, basically, you know, soybean from uh, developed countries. So uh, food safety is not a big problem. But it's about food security. I feel like a lot of agriculture experts already ask the question to with such huge population. So who can feed Chinese? But actually today, it seems that not really big problem. But anyway, when China becomes net global food importer, that means food security is still an issue. That means you know, we really need food supplies from other parts of the world. Yeah, from the United States, from Canada, from France, from other you know, countries. The more important thing is that China exports food to all countries in the world, every country. Yeah, in the world. And the largest importer of Chinese food includes the United States. Number one importer of Chinese food is Japan, the United States. Unbelievable. It's number two. Number two. Even the United States is a very big food producer, but still, maybe because of too many Chinese residents here. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. So, and South Korea, Hong Kong, of course. Yeah, Hong Kong doesn't produce food. Uh, 
you know, agriculture products. And Russia, Germany, Malaysia, Netherlands, Indonesia, and United Kingdom. At the top time, you know, export destinations of Chinese food. So when Chinese, you know, food becomes a problem in terms of food safety, those countries, including these countries, should really worry a lot. Canada is not really top importer of Chinese food, but still, in Western Canada, where I live, British Columbia, uh, we really have a lot of uh, food import from China. I really enjoy that. Now, you know, in my city, small city in Victoria, easy to buy every kind of Chinese food. If you want to cook Chinese food, easy. Okay, so, uh, and even more diverse than you can get in China, because you can get Chinese food from mainland China, from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from overseas Chinese communities, so even better than in China. So when you come to visit my uh, city, I will provide my you know, local Chinese honey cooking to you, anyway. So that's also, uh, uh, we are concerned with the food safety issue uh, in Canada also, because of Chinese food. And epidemics, yeah, epidemics, if you still remember that, you know, uh, so-called SARS, S-A-R-S, yeah, in 2003. It originated from Hong Kong, but evidently, it originated from Guangdong, yeah, a Chinese province neighboring Hong Kong. But, you know, the Chinese government tried to cover the issue. So the public didn't know when the disease became problematic. Uh, became a pro problem, became spreading to other regions. So only in Hong Kong, when people got, you know, uh, disease, you know, uh, contacted, and the public opinion got to know that, it was reported, and it became a big problem. So why Hong Kong was, you know, in the crisis of SARS in 2003, just because of the Chinese, you know, so-called policy to protect state secrecy. And because this is state secrecy. Yeah, why is it security? The secrecy? Because the Chinese government said, okay, if I let you know, okay, the spreading of this disease in Guangdong, the Guangdong economic performance would be negatively affected. So if you got economic performance was not so good, and the regime would be in crisis, and China would be in big crisis. So that's really steep security problem. And that's their logic. But anyway, so because of Hong Kong, then in Vancouver, then in European country, then in California, so everywhere, it became global, you know, pandemic disease. Actually, in history, in human history, a lot of such kind of pandemic disease, diseases originated from China. Yeah, it's uh, I'm patriotic Chinese, uh, but I have to admit this historical fact. Yeah, so even Black Death in Europe, yeah, that huge pandemic disease that changed history of Europe, yeah, was also, yeah, originated from China. And I also mentioned the migration and immigration, and now I think China is the largest country uh, with the, you know, uh, outward migration of immigrants. And also, not only because of the size of China, and also because of collection, right? If in the 1960s, so the size of China was also very big, the population of China was big, but uh, the connection between China and other parts of the country was really, you know, thin. As, so if you have a problem in China, uh, other parts, people don't worry about it. But today, uh, we emphasize the global nature of human sector issue. So because those issues are global issues. So air pollution, uh, acid rain, for example, and generally, okay, those uh, impacts on global climate change, environmental degradation, uh, ecological system, all the issues are, uh, you know, global issues. Uh, then also, because of economic globalization, yeah, China is uh, deeply involved in globalization, and uh, China is actually a huge contributor to, you know, uh, economic growth of the whole world. So when I talk about the SARS crisis in 2003, as an example, I already mentioned, okay, because of economic concerns, 
of Chinese government. So this became a big problem. So economic globalization can help spread pandemic disease from China, from other parts to other parts, to, to this part to other parts of the globe. And the economic concern of the Chinese government can actually help this kind of spreading of negative things rather than help to, uh, you know, govern that. And also, I like to mention, you know, those regional disputes uh, because of connection between China and other, you know, parts of the world. I already mentioned, you know, the Magnum River problem, yeah, between China and those Southeast Asian countries. Uh, also here, I'd like to very briefly talk about China and India's relationship <coughs> over the Himalaya glaciers, you know, uh, water resource. So when climate change uh, actually, you know, uh, becomes a problem, so glacier actually, uh, you know, uh, shrink, right? And water, you know, comes from Himalaya mountains, uh, basically to the side of India. And China actually uh, wants to control water resource in this regard. And India, you know, uh, depends on, you know, those major river of India, you know, the water, uh, you know, uh, depends on the Himalaya, uh, you know, uh, water reserve. So uh, actually, uh, for the two, uh, you know, uh, giant countries, uh, Historically, their relationship has been not so good, and economically, they are competi competing with each other, and uh, militarily, politically, basically, I don't think they have neutral trust. So they have trouble with each other, and also border problem, and now, you know, one more issue that is human security, you know, challenge. And so they have a dispute over those issues. Uh, I have to go quickly. And of course, because of inadequate of warnings and important actions. Basically, I think in terms of, you know, uh, of warnings of human security issues in international society, I have to criticize your government. Yeah, I'm sorry to do that. And uh, the United States, of course, is the leading country of the world. It's the only, you know, uh, Superpower, maybe, maybe one or two now. But, uh, anyway, so the most powerful country in the world. So, US policy is really important to determine the future of the world. But the United States pays a lot of attention to military security, to state security, to hegemonic circulation, to you know, economic competition between the United States and other rising economic powers, particularly China. So less on the issues of human security. I don't mean, you know, you, American civil societies, American people, they don't pay attention to this. I mean, uh, it seems that U.S. government, you know, is less, you know, uh, uh, actively, you know, uh, attentive to those questions than American people, than uh, another, you know, than some other countries, I mean, democratic countries, as I mentioned, European countries, uh, you know, Japan and Canada. So, other countries, actually, for example, Canada, cannot be really working, you know, effectively to gain pressure over China because we are small. Yeah. <coughs> Only 30 million population, you know, China's largest city, Chongqing, is larger in terms of population than the country of Canada. So. Uh, Canada can see something, but it doesn't work so well. European countries, of course, they like to see something like that. Yeah, European countries really like to emphasize human security issues. Yeah, you can see that from the Copenhagen you know, conference on you know, climate change issues. But European countries are not really effective you know, of doing that. And the United States, yeah, is really, you know, if the United States does more, that would be more helpful in this regard. So, when I say inadequate attention from international society, uh, I particularly refer to uh, U.S. government. Yeah, I really like to say, you know, State Department and White House and okay, uh, U.S. government as whole. Well, yeah, paid more attention in this regard. 
And uh, of course, you know, I had to create a warning for the entire. So I don't, I don't want to you know, totally blame the Chinese government. Uh, yeah, this picture, I mentioned, OK, the garbage issue in China. This picture is typical. Actually, if you visit, come to visit China, OK, when you work on you know, uh, the bound of uh, Shanghai, when you come to see uh, Chang'an Avenue, it's everywhere. It's so beautiful, no problem. Yeah, but if you come to those even small alleys, even in Beijing, you can encounter to picture like that. If you come to my home city, yeah, it's small city with 10 million population. Yeah, small city uh, in eastern China. Uh, the urban population is 1 million, and uh, the administrative region, yeah, covers population of 10 million. And every street corner, you can encounter a picture like this everywhere. So people just don't care about, you know, those daily life trash. And here we have classification of trash, right? Of course, for many years. And all the leading industrial countries, and even some new industrialized countries, they have this policy. Why Chinese government doesn't want to practice, you know, trash classific classification? If you are not able to implement that in rural areas, as well as in Beijing, you can do that, right? In Shanghai, you can do that. Evidently, I heard that there has been international advisory council working with Chinese government to promote this for already more than 10 years. But so far, I don't see any policy made by the Chinese government in this regard. Yeah, I'd really like to see this, actually. Yeah, in urban area, in huge cities, at least you should have this, you know, garbage, you know, classification, you know, policy. So, uh, if you go to Beijing on the street, you can see those different garbage trash. Evidently, you know, the classification is not enforced. You can just drop your garbage in. Evidently, even two garbage cans there. Evidently, you know. Chinese children, they don't care about that. But here, we know that our children are really vanguard in this regard. They care so much about you know, trash classification. But in China, they don't do that. So this is an adequate warning <coughs> among people, and also an adequate action taken by China, especially Chinese governments. I uh, actually use plurality. Yeah, not only the central government, but the local government. And local government, they just are concerned with, okay, uh, GDP, GDP, right? So numbers of economic status, they don't care so much for that. At the beginning, I read this question. So why the strong Chinese state, very capable state, uh, is weak in dealing with human security? And the Chinese government is also proud, proud of its ability to do whatever. Yeah, the Chinese government declares that whatever we like to do, we can do it. I believe in that. For example, I really wonder why there is magic, you know, actually impact of Chinese government's policy. Whenever when the Chinese government organizes huge international event in Beijing, immediately you can see blue sky in Beijing. That would be the Chinese government really has something to say with the guy, right? When the Chinese government has, you know, the natural, you know, ecological system, you can cooperate with me. I need blue sky and the nature. I mean, nature does that. So why you don't tell God every day, you know, we need, we need the blue sky? I said, I don't know why, actually. Uh, but I try to explain that. First of all, yeah, I like to use uh, this mentality, uh, you know, of state security or conceptualization, uh, a perception of state security, uh, you know, to explain that. The Chinese government is notoriously concerned with so-called state security and state sovereignty. When you criticize, the China, criticize China, if you are a Chinese guy, maybe that's okay. I, I'm not so sure, okay? But if you are foreign, definitely not okay. You are foreign. How could you be qualified to criticize China? 
There's you know, innovation, foreign innovation of Chinese did so well. And you are doing something to thread my debt security or to that. Yeah. Actually, the Chinese people, yeah, I don't think they really enjoy this kind of privilege to create the Chinese government. But uh, foreigners, yeah, are less privileged to do that, actually. So opposition to state security and state sovereignty not only provide, you know, critique from international society, from within China, bottom up, but also it doesn't pay attention to this. That's not a big problem. That's not a big problem. So, and very traditional worldview. They call it realist worldview and focused on comprehensive national power. Now the Chinese government yeah, is not only one dimensionally concerned with the military power. The Chinese government is not really military like that, you know, like North Korea, which is one to you. No. In 1960s, actually, Chinese Foreign Minister Marshall Chen declared that, okay, I can treat my fathers, okay, with a nuclear bomb, you know, and uh, I can treat my parents with nuclear bomb. It's uh, in Chinese, yeah. We are food, yeah, as in 1960s. That means, you know, not comprehensive national power. It's really concerned on military power. But now the Chinese leadership is not like that. Yeah, they really like to say, okay, we like to provide, you know, material, you know, uh, good material life to Chinese citizens. We would like to promote trade with every country in the world. And so now Chinese realist world view is updated, revised, modernized realist view. Focusing on comprehensive national power, including economic power, military power, soft power, whatever power, but state centric. Power of the government, power of party state. So it's not about individual citizens' power, it's about state power, the realist world. And I already mentioned weak international pressure. Yeah, uh, I don't want to repeat that. And also developmentalism with a little care of cause of development. So what is the most important for the Chinese government and for China in general as a nation? Of course, economic development. For individual citizens, make money. For the government, make money with the term, with the uh, slogan of economic development. So development is basic condition for many other good things. But if you are totally engaged in such thing called developmentalism, that means with whatever cost, you like to achieve GDP growth. And the cost could be really, really huge. The trick is when you don't care about something, and that thing could be really, really big. If you really care about the cost, you do something, the cost could be controllable, limited. If you don't care about cost of doing something, that cost could be enormous, could be really, really uh, big, actually. So we talked about that already. And also I'd like to talk about official corruption. Yeah, this even, this I've known, uh, I attended the Professor Skidmore's class, and uh, uh, students, uh, were concerned with uh, uh, anti-corruption campaign in China. Uh, here, I don't want to call, talk about you know uh, the, the campaign, but uh, corruption is also a uh, cause of the inability of Chinese government to deal with human security issues. Why? Uh, for example, food safety. So why food safety is not is is so difficult to be regulated, to be controlled, to be improved <laughs> in China? Because when you produce in safe food, if you are really big food provider, usually you have connection with the governmental officials. So the government cannot really take really serious attitude to punish you. So you just bribe those governmental guys, so the governmental regulations become actually worse. So official corruption really works in this regard. So. Uh, that negatively affects uh, governmental 
uh, you know, policy uh, in enforcement. Then I want to emphasize, you know, the role of civil society in promoting human security. Because the government cannot do everything. <coughs> yeah. The government is usually much concerned with state security. Because it's the state, right? As a nation. But human security, you know, civil society, people's own organizations are much concerned with human security. So that's why in this country, in Canada, in other democratic countries, so civil society, uh, NGOs play a huge role in this regard. But in China, NGOs, yes, are uh, also pretty active in doing that. But basically, NGOs are not welcome by the Chinese government. They are allowed to some degree today. There are civil society you know, factors in today's Chinese uh, governance. But still, uh, just uh, uh, last week, a Chinese journalist is, was a sentence of uh, imprisonment of uh, seven years uh, because she disclosed uh, information that two years ago, the Chinese government issued a document to buy seven items. You know, public opinions should not, cannot talk about those seven things. One item is civil society. So in Chinese official public media, you cannot talk about civil society. So even civil society in China today is reality, but <coughs> ideologically is illegitimate. So why the Chinese government doesn't allow people to talk about civil society? Because the regime has a problem in terms of legitimacy. So who gives you power? Why you guys, Xi Jinping, you should be you know, leader of China? Why not Li Keqiang within the leadership? Okay, why not Guo Xilai within the ruling elite? Why not me, for example, right? So that's a you know, really problem. When, that's why we fear of you know, competition from other you know, sectors. So the state takes repression over scientific actors, and that, uh, you know, uh, not good for improving human security issues. And uh, I don't want to talk too much, uh, but uh, the last one, uh, I'd like to use to analyze why Chinese governmental inability in dealing with human security issue is about the nature of collective action. Uh, you know, actually, in even democratic society, collective action is hard to achieve. Because if quality of air is public good, so if you do something to improve that, I do nothing, but I can share the improvement, right? So that's why people want to be free riders. That's why nobody wants to provide public good. So even in democratic country, people like to be free rider. I don't want to be involved. I don't want to pay my share of contribution. But because of the nature of public good, nobody can ban me from sharing the improvement of public good. In China, of course, it's even more difficult to do this, to improve public good. Anyway, I will use very short time to uh, wrap up my uh, 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 talk uh, to talk a little bit about uh, conclusions. And not so many conclusions actually. Uh, basically, I want to emphasize uh, the complicated situations of security uh, in today's world. So, in the post Cold War, I mean the Cold War era. So, when we talk about security, okay, nuclear threat from Soviet Union. Okay, so that's why we have Cuba missile crisis. That would be really huge crisis. And today, actually, people uh, don't really have, particularly in this part of the world, yeah, North America, uh, we don't have this you know, kind of direct, you know, military threat. North Korea, I don't think they can deliver bombs to you know, uh, North American continent. Uh, but the situation actually is more complex because of many other security issues, right? particularly human security. Human security is a huge role of so many critical issues, actually. And new difficulties and great uncertainties for China's development and foreign relations because of the rise of human security challenges. 
So because of a human sector challenge, so China's development could be less sustainable, right? Maybe not because of political reasons, not because of other things, but because of those challenges we just discussed, so the China model could be less sustainable, right? And so uh, that's also uh, new uncertainty in China's relation with other countries, as the exemplified by China's relation with India. Already not so good relationship, but some new issues because of uh, human security implications. Then challenges actually amount a not actually reduce. Yeah, even people already talk about human security issues since the mid 1990s. Even you know many leading countries, you know democratic countries, pay attention to this, uh, but still it's a big problem. And the Chinese government is really quick and adaptable learner in world politics. And people, uh, you know, international politics experts like to praise China's ability in learning. But China doesn't learn so quickly in this regard. Yeah, Chinese government really quickly like to use those fashionable terms, you know, in this country, in democratic world like an inclusive development, a balanced development, those things like that. But the human sector, this concept, so far, has not appeared in any official document of Chinese foreign relations. That's really bad. That's really bad. So the Chinese actually foreign document, foreign policy document, not to use those, you know, uh, fancy words, but these words, yeah, so far, is not adopted. In civil society organizations, some organizations began to use this term, human sector, to refer to some ecological issues in China. But the Chinese government, so far, doesn't know this term. Yeah. And this, I would like to emphasize, these challenge are challenges not from China to the United States in geopolitical terms. It's not challenge from China to other parts. It's challenge from China to China and to the rest of, China, uh, of the world. So I don't need some new threat from China to other parts of the world. So this is not new theory of China threat. It's actually China suffers first, and other parts of the world also suffer. So as a public issue for all of us, so I want to emphasize, so these are challenges to human beings, not only to our prosperity, development, but to our battle survival. Thank you. Would you be willing to take some questions? Yes, that would be my great pleasure to take your question. Yes, please. I see the environmental problems of China are dire, uh, but there is a great big trust for renewable energy, solar power, uh, wind. Do you think that will be fast enough to be able to ensure the human security? Uh, I have to admit that the Chinese government has taken some action already in this regard. Uh, but, as I mentioned, inadequate, because the problem is so big and so severe. So you need to take really huge action, you know, powerful action to do that. And the existing model of Chinese development, uh, if this model continues, even the government really wants to deal with that, those problems, but still, it doesn't work so well. For example, I'll give you a real, you know, example about the steel production. Yeah, steel, iron and steel production. China is the largest producer of steel in today's world. And the technology level of production of steel in China is uh, relatively very low actually. And the Hebei province is very big producer in this regard. I've heard that, you know, annual production of uh, steel 
in China can support the whole world for 10 years of consumption of steel. So why you need actually so much right, steel? Because local government want to have steel plant. Then they have GDP steadily ahead of you know, 1% of growth like that. And the central government really want to control that because Hebei is a one Beijing geographically. And so uh, you know, those examination groups came to locality to say, okay, you have to close down your steel you know, plant because this steel plant is small and the technology you know, level, usually small you know, plant uh, is with a lower you know, level of the technology of production. So close down that and give a number. It's okay. Under this threshold, so production, annual production with number, okay, like this, you should close down that. And okay, the next year, the examination group come again and say, how about you know, the implementation of the policy? Yes, we did. All those smaller plants were upgraded to <coughs> larger producer of steel. <laughs> so you said, actually, under this threshold, those plants should be closed down. But now those plants are bigger. So you, they should not be closed down. So the problem because becomes actually even more serious than before because of the examination and because of the policy. But just because of, that's what I talk about developmentalism. Uh, so if the existing model of development cannot be changed, so make the answer short, short. hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> So the government, the central government also know that. So that's why the current leadership, and particularly, you know, talked about the change of model of economic growth in China. Not driven by investment, but driven by consumption. But that's social issue, that's political issue. When people are not really rich, they don't have fat, you know, water, they don't want, you know, buy so many. So if you have a huge gap between the rich and the poor, so yes, generally China is rich, but many, many people, they are not rich. And those really rich people, they come to New York City to come down. <laughs> they come to Paris to come down. And they buy a lot of houses in British Columbia and making our house rise, you know, rising very quickly. And we suffer from that. And so the consumption cannot drive the Chinese economy. Because ordinary people, they don't have so much money to, you know, spend. So if you don't have a social reform and a political reform, actually, so the issue cannot be cannot be solved. So how can you change your track of economic growth from so-called investment-driven to consumption-driven? Uh, that's a systematic, you know, uh, 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 project. Actually, really hard to. Professor, if I could just add a statistic. You know, there's so many mind-boggling statistics about China. Um, but I just read recently that China used, between 2011 and 2013, China used more cement than the United States in the entire 20th century. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Uh, uh, there first, then uh, a young lady. So I know you talked a little bit about like some of the disputes. It's a little bit louder. Oh, yeah. Um, you kind of talked about a few disputes that China's been having with various nations. You include like India and the Himalaya glaciers, um, on the Mekong River, and then also like the East China Sea conflict that's going on right now. What sort of implications do you see that having on uh, Asia and the world? I guess. So the uh, it's a my year gets a gets a bit. So I guess just like the the disputes that China's been having with various nations, what kind of implications do you think that would have on, on Asia and the world? The maritime dispute. American, uh, the American, the maritime. Uh, yeah, you lie. Yeah, no, yeah. It's a, you know, uh, traditionally maritime, you know, uh, issues are not usual for China because China is not, was not outward, you know, country, and Chinese people, yeah, remember Zheng He, yeah, in ancient times, we traveled to Africa, to, you know, so many other, you know, 
we were not really interested in you know maritime territory or you know uh, connecting over you know ocean roads. But now China is building up its naval forces uh, very quickly and the maritime. Yes, but still, uh, look at the basic recent basis of Chinese President Xi Jinping to Pakistan. Actually, China as the I think that's very interesting. You know, the leadership still has the mentality, you know, uh, that doesn't trust the maritime transport, you know, ocean transportation and the maritime you know, connection uh, with other parts of the world. I still pay a lot of attention to land connections. Uh, maybe because, you know, one factor is U.S., you know, because the United States is maritime power, is naval power, and uh, China, okay, has a problem with, you know, ocean transportation of energy, of natural resources from Middle East, from African countries, you know, uh, through Malacca, you know, straight uh, to South uh, Eastern China. And uh, when the United States began to have the policy of returning to Asia to rebalance in China, and China began to worry about, you know, the safety, military safety, of these, uh, you know, transportation road, uh, you know, over in India and uh, India Ocean and South China Sea. So I think uh, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, China's uh, maritime neighbors, yeah, Japan, uh, the Philippines, uh, North Korea anyway, uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, those Southeast Asian China countries. So it seems that for China, it's much easier to make friends with you know land connected country. Yes, still some problem with Russia, with India, but Pakistan, right? But uh, uh, Myanmar and uh, okay, uh, North Korea troublesome. But basically, in past uh, uh, sixty years, uh, or more time, uh, it has been pretty good. But for those, uh, you know, maritime, you know, neighbors, I never see, you know, China has been good friend with that. I don't know why. Uh, maybe because we have a, you know, Asian philosophy of fearing of water. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> but this is uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, pretty interesting. You know, you, you know, uh, European nations, yeah, so Italian. It's just connecting all those you know nations together, right? But China, uh, even the broad sea, I mean inner sea of China, so there we don't use it as a you know route to connecting China with Korea with uh, you know northeastern China and eastern China. So we see that as a big obstacle. Yeah, the maybe too general. But we're interested in London. Yeah. Uh, uh, that young lady and this uh, gentleman. Hi, so just now you mentioned that um, U.S. should kind of uh, implement more policies to kind of contribute to human security in the So what kind of uh, policies, uh, what kind of suggestions do you have for these kind of policies to be implemented by the U.S. government? Okay, so big question. Yeah. So generally, I would like to say the United States government uh, pays more attention to those uh, so-called non-traditional security issues and my human security issues. Uh, actually, I think this is smart choice because if you emphasize human rights and you are in direct confrontation with the Chinese government, if you only emphasize those geopolitical issues, you know, military security, state security, also you are in competition, you know, with China as a state of cool power and China as Russian power. So people believe that. So a conflict between state of power and the Russian power is inevitable. So one is about geopolitical competition, one is about uh, political value competition. And the human security is between. So not really ideological, not really actually militarily, military oriented, not really state oriented. It's about people, you know, ordinary people's interest. So that doesn't mean, you know, in dealing with human security issues, the United States actually 
everybody should cooperate with each other. So the United States will not stand, you know, confrontationally with China. China is not enemy of the United States. So it's a really broad issue area where the United States and China can promote mutual cooperation, benefiting not only both peoples but also you know the peoples of the world. So less confrontational, less ideological, less you know uh, military really complicated. Now that's a would be a general suggestion I would like to tell uh, the State Department. Yes, thank you, Professor, for taking my question. I'm Max Nauer from Des Moines. My father was with the organization that is a key sponsor of this lecture, Principal Financial Group, before his retirement mm -hmm. some time ago. And to the point, Principal Financial Group has as a primary portion of their business uh, insuring against the risk of loss. In China, it seems to me uh, a, an absence of real entrepreneurship would tend to work against uh, such a business expanding. Would you please el elaborate whether, on whether that would be correct or not? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I believe I love, uh, you know, a fin more than financial system. I try to learn about that because that's really center of nerves a lot, yeah. you know, modern economy. Uh, I would like to, you know, connect that to the issue that young lady just raised. I think that, you know, uh, economically, financially, uh, if the American, you know, bankers, they like to invest in green sectors in China, uh, you know, with uh, some more considerations of human security implications. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, <coughs> you invest you know, for making money, for making fortunes. And actually, the green sector could be a uh, really promising sector. And uh, that would be, you know, not only making money, but also, yeah, you improve, you know, human security conditions in China and solve those uh, really big challenges to all of us. So I think, you know, if the bankers, they can have this kind of vision, so two projects, for example. One is making big money, but uh, without human security, you know, uh, positive human security implication. Maybe some negative human security implication. And another one, make less money, but really positive human security implications. I would advise, you know, why not this, uh, you know, you still make money but with human security implications, uh, positive. And maybe in the future, uh, you know, in the long term, so the return could be bigger than uh, another one, you know, which is making more money today because the human security concerns are becoming stronger and stronger everywhere because we live on this globe and the globe is in ecological crisis. So when all the people uh, more and more concerned with these kind of things. So these, you know, currently maybe with that project you make a little bit less money, but in the long term, and definitely that will be promised. So I'm really uh, bad at uh, money, so I, uh, I just want to say not to the moral advice. It's just a strategy, it's a strategy suggestion. Thanks for jumping. Yeah, thank you for your question.
usually when we talk about, you know, sometimes when from outside of China we criticize, you know, air pollution in China, uh, uh, I, you know, got uh, feedback like that, you know, uh, okay, 100 years ago London, you know, was with the London fog, and Tokyo, you know, 50 years ago with, you know, so called uh, industrial, you know, chemical industry, things like that. So uh, why, you know, we just criticize China? And uh, I think your point is really good. So we don't want to repeat those. Uh, uh, to my limited knowledge, the severity of those issues at that time were not, was not really, you know, so huge than today with China. Uh, but even that, so we don't want to repeat the mistake, yeah, uh, the first wave in your term of industrialization already made. So today, actually, uh, it's possible. It's possible with uh, you know technological development, with uh, you know scientific innovations. It's possible to do all the things you know with, uh, uh, for example, cleaner, uh, cleaner you know energy and uh, uh, less negative human security. Uh, also, I think you know you mentioned those countries like uh, uh, BRIC countries, uh, India, Brazil, uh, Russia. Uh, uh, I try to you know. Uh, compare actually when all the nations uh, experience uh, pretty fast economic growth, do they share similar or same model of economic development? If you know, for example, uh, like Brazil, I I I, I just have a, a, a one trip to Brazil, uh, so I don't know so much about the you know uh, economic uh, development in that country and the social condition. So if there is any difference, so why this kind of difference uh, between you know, uh, Brazil and China, for example? It seems that uh, uh, maybe population uh, matters. Yeah. So Brazil, I don't know. But anyway, uh, any systematic study in this regard, so comparing <coughs> China's experience with some uh, similar uh, you know, emerging economies Huge economy. Uh, maybe in this regard, China is doing better than India or Brazil. And in that regard, Brazil is doing better than China. If we can find, you know, uh, advantages of different countries, and we try to put them together, maybe not so ideal. But anyway, countries can learn from each other. So just as you said, not only learning from history, yeah, but also. Uh, learning from each other, uh, I think uh, it's possible to not totally, you know, uh, solve the problem, but then at the least we can, you know, stop the accumulation <coughs> of pollution further, and we can reduce the time of that, you know, human insecurity. Thank you. One very more much. question. One more. And uh, maybe a Thank center. You. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dr. Wu, uh, don't you think we have a kind of a Western bias here, uh, you know, with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Our ideas of security and freedom uh, are much different. We think of mobility and civil liberties and so forth. Uh, in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, their idea of freedom and security was being able to get a loaf of bread and uh, the heat goes on when you, in the wintertime. Uh, don't we have to take these uh, biases in, in account here? Great point, yeah, great point. It's uh, uh, at the beginning when I tried to um, differentiate between uh, human security and human rights, it's basically about uh, the conceptual power of human security, of human security. So I, just want to, I don't want to include everything in the concept of human security. But, you know, in, in the external connection of human security with the other thing, Yes, freedom is vital. It is critical. Yeah. When you don't have freedom, how could you improve your condition of living, actually? Not only in material, but also in some other dimensions. I definitely agree with you. Definitely agree with you. So, uh, in philosophical level, yeah, security, uh, uh, maybe I'm um, too west in that. Yeah. So, uh, without a freedom, you have no security. And actually, uh, that kind of security is not human security. It's, it's not security for human beings, right? So 
uh, adaptability. I would say in China, I have to say, uh, yes, freedom has been growing, increased, but very gradually, very slow. And not uh, with a straight line of uh, advancement and uh, zigzag. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, uh, retreat, uh, backlash. So uh, I guess in the long term, yeah, in the long term. So when people, they really have this kind of warnings of, uh, you know, uh, I think human security is one concept can help them to understand this kind of connection. So when you find that, okay, your air is problematic, uh, your food is not safe, and your children, and their future, even with more money, with uh, development, infrastructure, but their future could be worse than your future. And they will say, okay, we need to do something, and uh, they need freedom to do that. So in the long term, I'm quite uh, uh, optimistic in this regard. Yeah, thank you for your question. That's a really uh, good point. Professor, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us tonight, and thank all of you for coming.